turn in your Bible to the book of Hebrews, chapter 12. I want to talk today about the chastening in the life of a Christian. What is the place of chastening? Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Let's read that. Wherefore, seeing we, are, we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Okay, now I teach that the book of Hebrews is doctrinally pointed at a Jew in the time of Jacob's trouble. That's why it's called Hebrews. You know, right now there's neither Jew nor Gentile. Galatians chapter 3 verse 28 talks about that. But there are many things that will cross dispensational lines. And these first number of verses here I'm going to show you. Read in the book of Hebrews and then we're going to go back to the Pauline epistles and see verses that line up with these verses right here. Okay. Let's do that. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Whatever Paul has written to you as a Christian, um, if you compare it with other things in other parts of the Bible, be they future dispensations or past dispensations, um, the things that you're supposed to follow as a Christian are going to be laid out in the Pauline epistles. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 24 through 27. We'll read that here. It says here, Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize? So run that ye may obtain. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. Okay, and here's, here's the whole point. We're already starting to get to the point of this whole thing of chastening in the life of a Christian. Chastening is what God does to you if you don't judge yourself. All right? We see it right there. You're supposed to be running a race. Be very serious about that race that you're running. Uh, it says, verse 27, But I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means when I have preached to others, I myself, myself should be a castaway. Okay? If I'm preaching to you to you know, warning you about rock music or drugs or alcohol or whatever else, and I'm secretly messing around with the lust of the flesh and things and stepping out on my wife and doing all kinds of wicked stuff like that. Um, the Lord's going to have a problem with that, first and foremost. Secondly, all that stuff is destructive. So, you know, Christians mess up. Christians do sin. I'm aware of that. You've experienced it, I'm sure, since you've been saved. But the whole thing is here, the, the idea of this whole study is you have to keep yourself judged. And when the Lord convicts you and says, hey, you shouldn't have done that, stop doing it. If you don't, then God has to come in and chasten you. Go back to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 3. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. Boy, talk about true for today. Let me show you that one. Um, go to uh, Matthew chapter 15. And again, this is, this is instruction in righteousness. This is just, you know, we're to follow Paul's example, but, you know, Paul said, be followers to, you know, of me, even as I am also of Christ. So following Paul will link you up to many of the things that the Lord went through when he was here on the earth. This is going to be one of them. Matthew chapter 15, verse 10. <clears throat> Matthew 15, verse 10. And he called the multitude and said unto them, Hear and understand, not that which goeth into the mouth defileth a man, but that which cometh out of the mouth, this defileth a man. Then came his disciples and said unto him, Knowest thou that the Pharisees were offended after they heard this saying? But he answered and said, Every plant which my heavenly Father hath not planted shall be rooted up. 
Let them alone, they be blind leaders of the blind, and if the blind lead the blind, both shall fall into the ditch. Okay, stop right there. What you're going to notice as a Christian, especially if you get into any kind of ministry, you're going to offend people. I mean, it's really not possible to preach the Word of God and teach the Word of God and share what the Lord's shown you through Scripture and not offend people. I mean, you're going to get some of the brethren and they're going to be happy and, hey, I really appreciate that. Boy, it's the same thing I'm going through. You know, it's going to be really good to them and other ones are going to be like, I don't think you made your point there. And you're going to get this fighting and then you're going to get lost people saying, that was very offensive to me and that's a hate crime and this and that. That's just the way it's going to be. Okay? And what's Jesus' advice? Let them alone. You offend lost people because you tell the truth, not because you're doing wrong. If you offend lost people because you're doing wrong, then it's that's bad. You need to judge yourself on that. But if you're doing right and you're telling the truth and they get offended, let them alone. They're blind leaders of the blind. All right? But look at this. Let's continue here. Verse 15, Then answered Peter and said unto him, Declare unto us this parable. It's not a parable. <laughs> Verse 16, And Jesus said, Are ye also yet without understanding? You're going to feel that way many, many times as a Christian, especially when you get into ministry. You'll get these people, you know, and, they'll, and, the, you know, and I, if you've written me questions, I'm not, and it's good questions and stuff, I'm not singling you out. I'm talking to these people that are like, I mean, I get some really weird stuff. Watch some of my videos on the weird comments that I get, you know, on this channel. And some of these people, they ask me these questions, and I'm just going like, whacking my forehead going, are you yet without understanding? Don't you get it? I mean, this is just, you know. Verse 17. Do not yet ye yet understand that whatsoever entereth in at the mouth goeth into the belly and is cast out into the drought. But those things which proceed out of the mouth come forth from the heart, and they defile the man. For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man, but to eat with unwashed hands defileth not a man. All right, again, there are many standards that are fine to keep and things like that. Eating something, you should probably, you know, you should wash your hands before you eat. But, you know, if you don't, well, that's, you know, and you get a little bit of dirt in your mouth or something like that, well, okay. You know, but people will look at that and they'll say, that's gross, that's disgusting. But then they'll sit around and watch television with all the profanity and perversion and everything else. It's really kind of a weird society we have. Some guy out there, you know, um, working in the garden or something like this and comes in, there's dirt underneath his fingernails and he's eating a hamburger or something or whatever. And people are like, oh, that's disgusting. Yeah, and you're just, you know, partaking in all kinds of filth. Watch with your television and your jokes and your speech and whatever else. See? It's really kind of an interesting thing there. But you will see this when dealing with lost people. They'll get offended over just stupid nonsense. And you look at them and you're going, well, you know, check out uh, one of my favorite things to do. I get these people and they, they just like, they'll say, you're not a real Christian. And, you're, and they'll try to quote scripture against me or something like this. Or Jesus told me to say this to you. And it's like, no, he didn't. That's not anywhere at all in Scripture. And I check out their people that they subscribe to. Immodest, filthy, wicked, just horrible stuff. And they have the nerve to come onto this channel and attack me. You know, I'm not perfect. I'm, I'm not saying I am. But it's just, you know, crazy. But the real distressing thing is, when you're dealing with people like that, you'll get other professing Christians that they'll come and they'll show a very high degree of ignorance sometimes, just kind of like Peter did. And you're just going like, are you yet without understanding? Don't you understand what I was trying to say? You know? Yeah. <clears throat> Look at uh, Matthew chapter 17. Go over there. Matthew chapter 17, verse 14. And I'm reading these verses, you know, tying this into this study because this is a really, really big part of what's going on right now, especially as the falling away is just, you know, in high gear right now. It's really, really bad. Matthew chapter 17, verse 14. Read down to verse 21. And when they were come to the multitude, there came to him a certain man kneeling down to him and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is lunatic and sore vexed. For oft times he falleth into the fire and oft into the water. 
and I brought him to thy disciples, and they could not cure him. Then Jesus answered and said, O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him hither to me. Little interesting, neat little thing there when you understand the rapture and things like that. It's just like right now, our spirit, we're just going like, we look at this world and we're just trying to witness to people and they come up with these stupid questions. I mean, just questions that's designed to put off salvation and try to confuse you as a Christian and the whole thing. Well, what about this? What about this? It's just like, we're just going like, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? You know? Now, what's the thing there? I'll bring him hither to me. We're having to put up with a whole bunch of ridiculous nonsense right now as Christians as this world's just falling apart. And what's the solution? Well, bring the body of Christ up to the Lord. Bring him hither to me. You know? Yeah, looking forward to it. But you will go through this thing. You know, you're, just, you're dealing with these lost people and sometimes it just gets so frustrating. And you're just like, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Verse 18, And Jesus rebuked the devil, and he departed out of him, and the child was cured from that very hour. Then came the disciples to Jesus apart and said, Why could not we cast him out? And Jesus said unto them, Because of your unbelief. For verily I say unto you, If ye have faith as a grain of mustard seed, ye shall say unto this mountain, Remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. And then we'll just skip that verse because it's not in the oldest and best manuscripts according to the New Version scholars and the Nestle's team and all the other stuff there. I'm not joking, by the way. Uh, Matthew chapter 17, verse 21 is not in most of the New Versions except for down at the footnote. And then many times if it's just a little compact study Bible or something, they'll remove the footnotes. So the verse is not in anywhere at all. Yeah. Let's read the verse in our King James Bibles. Matthew 17, verse 21, Howbeit this kind goeth not out, but by prayer and fasting. Interesting that the formula to kick out higher-powered devils is removed from the NIV. Hmm. And the oldest and best manuscripts. Sure, sure. Go back to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12, we'll read that verse again, verse 3. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. Um, one of the quickest ways to give up as a Christian and get really frustrated is to start looking at other Christians or other professing Christians. Uh, I deal with them all the time, and um, it can get very frustrating. I mean, my brothers and sisters out there you know, in Christ that are encouraging this ministry and things like that uh, you keep me going believe me but some of the people i deal with it's just like oh, you're going are you yet without understanding don't you get it you know how long shall i be with you how long shall i suffer you you know it, it, it frustrates me so much i get these people well you know i, I know that you teach a pre-trib rapture but what about this this and that i have these three arguments and i'm like i've answered this stuff like you know six years ago <laughs> I have so many studies answering this, this whole post-trib thing. I mean, I don't know of one argument that these people have that I haven't answered over and over and over again. And I'm just going like, they're, they're, you know, you haven't proved anything. Yes, I have. I've proved it for years and years and years. How long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? You know, and I know that there's a lot of people that are trying to get me kicked off of this, you know, off of YouTube and things like that. I see it. I see you get these comments and things and stuff. You've been reported and, and everything else. You know, we're going to shut your channel now. We, you've been reported, you hateful bigot, you, or something like this. Okay. Um, you're coming onto my channel and attacking me, but I'm the one that's a hateful bigot. Whatever. But I see this thing a lot, and it's like, you know, when you kick all the Bible believers off of the Internet, if, you, if they come out with some kind of laws or whatever else and call us racist because we use a Bible or something like this, or, you know, I have no idea. I mean, you're a racist for anything. You know, you look at somebody wrong, you're a racist. You, you say the wrong thing, you're racist. You know, live in the wrong area, you're a racist. I mean, it's just, it's insanity. But you fly the wrong flag, you're a racist too, you know. It's, it's insane. This country is just falling apart. But they're, you know, so anxious. 
these people, these reprobates, are so anxious to get rid of Bible-believing Christians, and yet they don't understand what's going to happen when we're gone. You know, I just wish you Christians were all gone. Well, uh, you might want to realize that that is going to happen at uh, some point in the near future, and uh, when we're all gone, uh, that's the time of Jacob's trouble gets started, the worst time on earth. God has a lot of restraint, okay, right now. You think all the floods and the fires and the earthquakes and the oh, civil unrest and wars and rumors of wars and pestilence and all so you think it's bad now? God's restraining some things, okay? He's taking it easy. You know, when the body of Christ leaves, then he says, okay, no more reason to take it easy. And there will be a great multitude to get saved out of that time, but uh, it's going to be rough. Worst time period ever in the history of man. But let's continue here. Uh, Hebrews chapter 12. Let's go down to verses 4 and 5. Ye have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. And ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. Okay? Very interesting here. It says, Ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. Who is it talking to? Well, specifically, so to the Jews of the Old Testament. All right? They've forgotten it. How many Jews do you think were really walking around carrying an Old Testament and studying the Old Testament? You know? Probably not too many. They'll talk about the Torah and things, the first five books of, of Moses and whatever, but a lot of them there aren't going to get into the whole Old Testament and study it. But for those that have forgotten it, let's actually look at the verses that it's referring back to. Go to Job chapter 5. Back to the Old Testament, the book of Job. Trying to keep, you can keep your finger there in Hebrews chapter 12 because we'll be coming back to it. But Job chapter 5, verse uh, right here, 17 through 19. Let's read those verses. Job chapter 5, verse 17. Behold, happy is the man whom God correcteth. Therefore despise not thou the chastening of the Almighty. For he maketh sore and bindeth up. He woundeth and his hands make whole. Okay? So there you have your tie-in. That right there is what's going on in the book of Hebrews. Ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. Okay? But I just want to include verse 19 back here in Job chapter 5. Check this out. This is very interesting. He shall deliver thee in six troubles, yea, in seven there shall be no evil touch thee. Hmm. Three sets of seven judgments, seven uh, seals, seven trumpets, seven vials. Very interesting. Uh, Job is a picture of a uh, Jew in the time of Jacob's trouble, a tribulation saint. That he's sitting there on the ground, he's being had this horrible stuff happen to him and things for seven days, seven years. Hmm. And it says there in verse 19, he shall deliver thee in six troubles. Interesting because the mark of the beast is six hundred, three score, and six. Yea, in seven there shall no evil touch thee. There will be a remnant that gets saved through that time of Jacob's trouble. Just thought I would include that. It's pretty interesting. But now go from uh, Job to the book of Proverbs, chapter 3. We're going to see this thing again. Proverbs, chapter 3. Beginning in verse 11. Proverbs 3, 11 and 12 says, My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, neither be weary of his correction. For whom the Lord loveth, he correcteth, even as a father, the son in whom he delighteth. A good father is going to correct his son. I'm learning that with mine. You know, my son, I'm saying. Go back to Hebrews chapter 12, verse 6 and 7. It says here, For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons, for what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? Now, is that true for us today? Well, obviously, yes. Just put this thing here. 
we're going to look up a verse here in, in uh, 1 Corinthians. But when you read the Bible, again, you can see over here, verse 5, Ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. Okay, now that can apply to us. You know, I mean, you can certainly make the argument there. But when you have it specifically written to Hebrews, the Jews, the Jewish people, um, and you think of the, the timing of when this whole thing is going to be fulfilled, when this is really going to be written to them, it makes perfect sense because they have forgotten a lot of the Old Testament. They're not really, you know, some of them, you know, they'll read the Old Testament, but for, for the most part, they have replaced much of the Old Testament with their own traditions, their own teachings, and uh, many times which are very, very contrary to Scripture. Um, but they've forgotten it, but they're going to remember it in the future. But verses 6 and 7, For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. Every son. Now, as Christians, are we sons of God? Yes, we are. Absolutely. So, he will scourge every son whom he receiveth. Let's go back to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Again, does this teaching here about the chastening of the Lord, does it line up with Pauline epistle doctrines written to Christians? And the answer is absolutely. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 27 through 34. Here you have uh, um, verse 23 through 26. You have basically, uh, they're you know, doing a communion type of a thing is what most people would call it, where you are you know, partaking of the Lord's... Well, well, we'll just read it. Let me just read it. Verse 23, For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he brake it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. Remembrance. It's not a way to forgive your sins or something like this. It's a time of self-examination. You're remembering what Jesus Christ did on the cross. Uh, verse 25, After the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. Again, remembrance. Two times. Both things are remembrance. It's not that you do your magical hocus-pocus ceremony of the Catholics, the Eucharist, and transubstantiation. You turn it into actual blood and flesh and things, and then that's how you get your salvation for at least, you know, ten minutes or an hour or two, whatever, until it goes out the drought, as we read earlier. <laughs> uh, no, it doesn't work. Verse 26, For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. The second coming of Jesus Christ is tied in with this whole thing. Very interesting. Now let's look here. Verse 27. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. All right. Why would you be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord? Well, because those, uh, the, what he did on the cross is he paid for your sins. Now there's two ways to look at this thing. You have a somebody that's coming in that they're not genuinely saved and they're partaking of the Lord's table there. They're partaking of communion and they're saying, I'm doing this for remembrance. Well, <laughs> remembrance for what? You might be remembering what Jesus Christ did on the cross, but it wasn't to pay for your sins because you haven't accepted him yet. You see? So that's one way to look at it. A person that's not genuinely saved. The second way to look at it is somebody that's saved, but they're messing around with their sin. Okay? They're, you know... They're not confessing certain sins and things, and they're continuing in those sins. You're going to see both ways here. Okay? Verse 28. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. That doesn't mean that it's been transformed into the Lord's actual physical body there, and you got to eat it. If it did, you'd be violating the scriptures that talk about eat. You know, you're not to eat uh, flesh and drink blood. Okay, as far as you know, living flesh. I'm talking about. Obviously, if you cook it, that's fine. But again, see, you can go either way. A false convert, somebody that's not you know genuinely saved, and 
they're not really thinking about what Jesus Christ did, that he paid for their sins, a kind of an easy believism type of a person. Uh, they don't just kind of eh, flip an attitude towards sin and things like that. Yeah, well, I'm a sinner. Yeah, we're all sinners. You know, whatever, you know. What do I got to pray again? You know, let's make this fast. I got things to do, you know. See? That's a problem. But then you also have somebody that's messing around with sin. Uh, that's another problem. You say, well, how would that work with damnation, though? Some Christian that's genuinely saved, but they're messing around with, with sin. How would it you know, be there? Um, verse 29 he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. Okay, well, how does that work? If they're saved, how can you get damnation if you're actually saved? Well, uh, very simple. Uh, God can make your life a living hell here on this earth. Um, you can have some pretty bad stuff happen to you as a Christian. And I'm going to show you this in the next couple of verses. Verse 30, For this cause, many are weak and sickly among you, talking to saved people, and many sleep. When you start to mess around with sin, it will mess around with your health. And if you don't get you know, in a repentant state there and say, Hey, God, I'm sorry. I need, to, I need your help to get me out of this thing. He can actually get you to the point where you die early. Many sleep. All right? And it doesn't mean this is not teaching soul sleep or something like this, that when you die, your soul, body, soul, spirit goes into the grave and it just kind of... You're in this like comatose state or something like that. You know, your flesh is rotting, but your soul and your spirit are kind of stuck to this rotting corpse. I guess if you're there long enough, it's just soul and spirit in the you know, ground or whatever. No, 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 no. That doesn't work. That's, you know, heretical. Um, again, you have non-dispensational people. They'll take things like Abraham's bosom and they'll say, well, see, that's for today. And you know, Non-dispensational people make a mess of the, of the Bible. It's terrible. What it's talking about there is many sleep, it means their body, okay? Uh, sleeping in the sense of they're dead, waiting for, you know, the rapture is what that's talking about. Verse 31, for if we would judge ourselves, very important, we should not be judged. Self-judgment. You look at something dirty on the internet, you don't go, well, I don't know, maybe it wasn't that bad. You say, Oh, God, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have done that. I, oh, please, Lord, forgive me. Judge yourself. You covet. Judge yourself. You tell a dirty joke or you do this or you whatever. Judge yourself. Why? So that you don't have to be judged. Verse 32. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord that we should not be condemned with the world. Hmm. When you don't confess those sins that God's convicting you of, and you're getting a little bit carnal and things like that, the Lord will come in and He will chasten you. I'll tell a story from years and years ago, right after I first got saved, I still had a pornography addiction and things, and it was I was not like it was before I was saved. Uh, there was definitely, you know, the Lord was kind of helping me to overcome that thing, but I still struggled with it. And I remember this one time, I... Uh, had looked at some, you know, and things, and then like the next day I was out cutting firewood, and and I remember it wasn't really. I was kind of like, you know, oh Lord, sorry for that, but it was still the lust was still there, the desire was still there to see more, and I was thinking in my mind, maybe just a little bit more, you know, later today or something like this, and I remember I was cutting firewood, and um, this big tulip poplar tree had, you know, came down right in these all these big rocks and everything else, and I was stepping. Um, and I, and I had my saw running and I remember I stepped back and I thought it was a rock there and all it was was just some leaves between two rocks. It looked like flat ground or a rock or something. And I put my foot on that and it went down in a hole and I'm falling backwards with a running chainsaw. And, you know, all I could do was take the saw over like this and I couldn't get my hand back in time to catch myself. And I landed right on this pointed sharp rock hit me right right about three inches probably to the to the right of my spine right boom right there lower back and it was it was so painful it was terrible and I had to go to the hospital and everything and and uh, I bruised my pelvis there and stuff like that and I mean it was it was bad I was afraid I was gonna have like internal bleeding because I'm like did I hit my kidneys back in here <laughs> so you know um, but it, it hurt you know bad 
and I mean, I could barely even walk out of the area. It was, it was really bad. But I thought to myself, what was that? I was a chastening of the Lord. And how did I know that? I was doing wrong. I hadn't confessed that wrong. And the Lord allowed that thing to happen to me, but preserved me. If it had been just a few inches over and I'd have hit my spine like that, I don't know. I might have been ended up being paralyzed. So, I mean, I hit hard. <laughs> I fell pretty good distance, and I hit pretty hard. And uh, I've had other things happen, you know, times when it was like, I shouldn't be doing this. I know I'm not supposed to be doing this. I'll give you another good example. I've talked about this in other studies. Um, chocolate. Uh, struggled with the thing of, of really liking chocolate. And uh, for some odd reason, certain types of chocolate, uh, uh, there are certain kinds that if I eat them in the evening, I'll wake up the next day and I'll have a headache that'll last about 12 hours. And it's a, like migraine times 10. I mean, it's to the point of migraine headache. You know, you just barely move your eyes to either side and it's just like pain shooting up into your head and, and you know, sick and nauseous and just just half out of it and there's nothing that you can do i mean i used to take i'd try to take like excedrin and stuff which is majorly toxic and i tried to i tried everything to get rid of these headaches nothing worked it was just time i had to go through this time it would get out of my system and i learned my lesson the first time and i never ate it again <laughs> no there are many times i went back to it sometimes within days and I'd be sick, you know, oh, Lord, Lord God, forgive me. I, I'm so dumb. I'll never do this again, you know. And I'd go back and do it again, you know. Stupid. Really, really stupid. And, you know, I haven't done that in a long, long time. So, you know, you will get victory over certain sins. You will have struggles and things like that. You're always going to struggle with sin. But you will have certain things that you're going to get victory over in time. Again, if you're newly saved, you're going to have some of those things. And you're going to be like... I really need help with this and think keep reading the book keep praying keep doing what you're supposed to do the Lord's going to take you through the process of sanctification um, and he's going to chasten you when you do wrong I am living proof <laughs> you know uh, I have scars to prove some of my chastening because the, the old head gets a little bit hard up here and I thank the Lord for it that's the other thing too But now let's look at the other part of the thing of chastening. Go back to Hebrews chapter 12. Chastening in the life of a Christian. Uh, the Lord will do that. And we're going to continue with this line of thinking, why the Lord chastens you. We're going to see some more scriptures on this. But there's another part of this. Okay, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 8. It says here, But if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers. Was there ever a dispensation when God didn't chasten someone? that was saved? Nope. God will always chasten every son whom he receiveth. Any man or woman, and of course you understand in the Bible, sons of God and things like that. That's a, the brethren is a reference to men and women. You know, understand that. God sees the distinction, obviously, but he just says sons and things. So understand that. But any dispensation that there's ever been, God will always chasten you if you're saved. But if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, everybody that's ever been saved, then are ye bastards and not sons. Do you ever run into these Christian Christians and they say, I just don't understand you know, God in the Old Testament. I just don't understand. I don't understand Him. There are a lot of things about God that I don't understand. Why He would do this and why He would do that. You know why that is? Well, according to this verse here, they're bastards. You know what a bastard is? A bastard is somebody that doesn't know who their father is. I don't have a problem with anything the Lord did in the Old Testament. I understand what sex perversion leads to. I understand what how it defiles people and, and defiles a whole nation and things like that. We can see it today, can't we? So the Lord goes in and says to the Jews, Hey, go on into that country and you kill every single man, woman, and child. Kill the animals too. I know why. Because it was rampant. Sex perversion. And you get sex perversion to a certain level, those people don't want out. 
So the Lord in the Old Testament times, he said, hey, go on in there and kill them all. I have a problem with that? No, sir. My father did it. He knows the hearts and the minds. He can judge people. I can't always judge people perfectly. I'm supposed to judge people according to the Scriptures. I'm a Christian. I have standards, a perfect standard by which I can judge people. But the Lord is the perfect judge. He's the one that can understand and really say and pass the real, real proper judge. The Bible calls him the judge of all the earth. All right, back in the book of Genesis. But if you have a problem with that, you might want to check and, and see if you really even know your father that you profess to know. I just don't like to read parts of the Bible because it's, it's, you know, kind of controversial. And, and, you know, God says some things that he's for and tells him to do certain things. And I just, I can't accept those things. I just have to reject that part. Then you don't know your father. You're a bastard. But here's the real thing with this. If ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. Do you ever see these guys? Well, they're Christians and things like this, and they're corrupt, and they're wicked, and nothing bad ever happens to them. Was Jack Hiles ever brought to justice? Just came out with my video about that. Was he ever brought to justice? Nope. On earth. He's had his justice now. Uh, God has him where... Uh, People like that go, hell, okay. <laughs> um, I don't believe for one minute the guy was saved. He was preaching false gospel. He was preaching easy believism. He's kind of the, the real originator of that whole thing, taking, removing repentance from salvation. You know, just changing and saying repentance is going from unbelief to belief, which is stupid nonsense. And he came out with these little arguments, you know, the Bible says that God repented, so I guess you are saying that God's a sinner. <laughs> you know, uh, no, read the context, you know. Just a wicked, wicked, disgusting man. Doing all kinds of things. Standing there preaching and his wife is over here on his left side or right side, whatever. I forget the exact thing. You can watch the video. Although some of you can't because YouTube blocks it. I mean, go figure that. Talk more about that in a minute. But, you know, he's got his wife over here and he's got Jenny Nishik, the, the deacon's wife over here. And he's sleeping with both. Where's the chastening? Where's the chastening? You say, well, Jack Scapp, uh, the Jack Hiles' son-in-law, he went and had a sex, you know, fornication with a 16-year-old girl. Took her across state lines to, to fornicate with her so he could try to avoid prosecution. You say, well, he went to prison, so God's chastening him. No, he got caught. Okay? I don't believe that the man is saved. I mean, he came out, it was all, you know controversial and stuff like this he was rejecting the king james bible for a while till he got too much pressure then he oh i, I and he kind of backed off a little bit so many of these people you look at their lives where's the chastening very simple formula brethren no chastening equals no salvation you can see people that'll get messed up there's you know again just to explain this there are doctrines that we can agree to disagree on that's fine not a problem but when you see major doctrines and things like this and people teaching something totally wicked and you watch them and you go, where's the chastening? I don't see any. What are you dealing with? A bastard. And you know, the modern world has taken that word and they've, they've twisted it and then turned it into a filthy cuss word and whatever else. It's a scientific term. A bastard is someone who does not know who their father is. Simple. We need to be real careful. Again, you know, they, oh, well, you're not supposed to judge and things like this. Man, you got to judge. You have to be able to say, you know, look at people's lives and things. I mean, do you ever realize there, how much stuff is in your New Testament that goes over the thing of how to judge if somebody's saved or not? Why? Because it's been real important throughout church history. I mean, back in the Dark Ages and things like this, you know, having a Bible... You know, nobody had Bibles for most of the Dark Ages and in their own language, in their own tongue. But, you know, the, some of the sects and things of Christians that were there long before the Reformation years, uh, the Waldenses and things like, you know, the Vaudois and some of the others. And these people, uh, some guy comes in and says, I'm a Christian. Can I come into your group? Oh, sure. Come on in. Welcome. All are welcome. You know, let's give you a hug and stuff. And a, here's your, you know order of service or whatever for today. 
Uh-uh, no. People had to be careful. Why? Because the Catholics were going out and hunting down heretics and executing them. You have to be able to judge. And as time goes by, it's going to become very important for us today to judge people, whether they're saved or not. They come in, I'm a Christian, and you go, really? Uh, what is God's perfect word? Well, I prefer the King James Bible. You say, okay, do you prefer? Do you believe that this King James Bible is God's perfect word? Well, where it's translated accurately, yes. You know, uh, no, that doesn't work, okay? Again, you're not, you're not a Bible believer if you say where I believe it where it's translated correctly. So, you know, where it's translated incorrectly according to your mind, then it's not God's word. Well, if it's not God's word in a few places, well, then it's the whole thing's off, you know. So, you have to be able to trust the whole book. That's the stand a Bible believer takes. You don't agree with that? Well, go someplace else, watch something else. But my whole point is here, brethren, there are multiple standards by which you can use to judge if somebody's genuinely born again or not. And a lot of times you'll get feelings from the Lord and you shouldn't rely just solely on feelings. I mean, sometimes you will get a gut feeling about somebody and you'll just be like, you know, you'll listen to some preacher. I mean, there's so many of them out there and you'll listen to them and you go, yeah, yeah, okay, they said some good stuff, but I just, I don't know what it is. I got a weird feeling. Well, that's good. That's the Holy Spirit's, you know, the gift of discernment there that he's, that he's enabling in you and things. And you, and you start to go, uh, uh, I don't know about this. But the real standard is right here. And one of those standards is you start to talk to him about doctrine. You start to talk to him about things and stuff like this. And you start to realize, uh-oh, they're pretty bad. Look for chastening. And if there's no chastening, I would say chastening is probably the last of the standards. You go through and you say, tell me about your salvation. Tell me your testimony. They say that, right? You say, okay, what do you believe about, about this King James Bible? They say that, right? You say, okay, what about this? What about that? You know, are you, do you believe in the catching away of the body of Christ before the time of Jacob's trouble? Do you believe in eternal security? Do you believe in all these different things? And if they're getting them all right, and then they get something really wrong, look and see, is there some chastening there? Okay? Again, uh, there's some people that are in a process there of the Lord showing them different things and whatever. Um, just kind of step back. I mean, there are some, some preachers out there that, you know, people say, what do you think about, you know, different brethren and stuff like this? And I'm like, I don't know. I don't know. Do you think that they're saved? Do you think that they're legitimate? I have no idea. I'm just kind of looking and saying, I see some major problems there. And uh, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to let the Lord chasten them. If they're saved, there's going to be chastening. If I look at them for a while and I don't see any chastening, okay, see ya. Very simple. Romans chapter 8. You know, you can still play Christian. Pretend to be a Christian. But the time is coming, brethren, when that's going to go away. Romans chapter 8, verses 1 through 13, says, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. See, because you're going to get people and they're going to say, you know, well, you know, it, you're saying that there has to be chastening there and stuff like this. Well, the Bible says there's no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. You know, you get this thing. I've heard this. A lot of the hyper dispensationalists will get into this thing. They'll say, well, the, because the blood of Jesus Christ cleansed us from all sin, therefore, you don't technically sin anymore. And so, you know, it's a freeing kind of a feeling because you don't have to judge yourself for your sins. You can just kind of say, well, it's all paid for. So sinning, I don't really have to confess it anymore. I mean, I deal with the whole gamut of people out there, believe me. <laughs> and, you know, I've seen this thing. And they'll quote Romans chapter 8, verse 1. There's no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. Keep reading, though. Who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. What happens if you walk after the flesh as a Christian? And you don't confess it? You don't judge yourself? Chastening. Whack. Here comes a spanking from the Lord. You can mess up. 
You can mess up and do something stupid and just go, oh, Lord, I'm so sorry. You know, as I've said before in other studies, I you know, heard a thing from an older black woman, the one time saved sister, and she said, as far as her sins, she said, I fess them as I does them. Hmm? Confess them when you do them. To give the proper English there. <laughs> but I like the, the thing better. I fess them as I does them. You mess up, get it confessed quickly. Judge it quickly. Judge it harshly. Don't say, well, you know, I, I don't know. I, I, it's the, be very self-judging. Not at the point where you're going around, oh, I don't know if I even got saved and I'm all defeated. And, uh, you know, No, no, no. Don't do that. But judge your sins and say, Lord, I'm sorry. Help me to do better you know, for the rest of the day or tomorrow or whatever. But let's read here. Romans chapter 8, verse 2. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Again, you see that thing there. He's not just saying, you have a free thing there, you know, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. You know, it's, Paul writes another place there. Um, it's not that you can just go on and continue in sin and not have any guilt for it. Okay? The, the not having guilt there is when you're walking in the Spirit, you see. And that doesn't mean, well, I'm in the Spirit so I can sin and it doesn't bother me. It's not how this thing works. Verse 5, For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. If you're messing around in the flesh, you can't please God. Just as simple as that. You can go to heaven. Absolutely. His blood paid for your sins. But if you are messing around with sin and you're not judging yourself, you're going to be having some chastening coming your way. Verse 9. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. You can't just say, I can't help myself. I just, I just sin and I, there's nothing I can do. No, no, no. If you're in Christ Jesus, then you have the Holy Spirit there to convict you of those sins. Verse 10. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you... He that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his Spirit that dwelleth in you. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live after the flesh. Now look at this, because you'll get this, again, a hyper-dispensationalist. They'll say, yeah, but you know, it's all paid for. It's all paid for. I'm in the Spirit. I don't have to even be concerned about sinning in the flesh and things, because I can't sin, you see, because of Christ's imputed righteousness. So technically, I can't. Well, that's talking about eternal things, forgiveness any, as far as heaven or hell. In eternity. It's not talking about the damnation that you can have in this life, where your life can become a wreck and a living hell on this earth. I'm not using profanity. I'm just saying that damnation we read about in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. All right? You're going to see that. Look at verse 13. This is, you know, being written to saved people. For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. That's written to save people. Yes, you are to judge yourself. No, you are not. do not have freedom to just say, well, I'm just going to sin and I'm just not going to let it bother me because it's been paid for. Okay? Again, going back to the thing of communion. What are you doing there with communion? You're remembering what Jesus Christ did on the cross to pay for your sins. Now, if... He paid for your sins and suffered such a horrible, humiliating death. Why would you have a flippant attitude about those sins? Oh, I don't mind. You know, I just keep doing them occasionally and stuff. Yeah, you know, it's not going to hurt anybody. It hurt him. It hurt Jesus. Did you ever think about that? Well, you know, to me, it's <clears throat> I'm forgiven. I'm saved. I'm born again. I'm just going to go do what I feel like doing. And, you know, that's, that's paid for. You know, it's kind of like you go and you, you have somebody say, uh, 
I'm going to you know, take two soldiers and they're both given a mission to go to some city and deliver a message. And, they, and the military, the commanding officer says, here's a special uh, card. You know, they have these cards that you can get in the military and then you can go like a charge card and you can go and you, you know, get a motel, stay at whatever else. And then one soldier goes and he goes, man, I'm here in the city. I'm going to live it up. I'm going to go out and see how much I can charge on this card. I'm just going to do what I feel like doing. You know, it's, it's all paid for. The other soldier goes in there and he goes, I'm here on a mission. Well, you got this card, you can buy whatever you want. Yeah, but you know what? This costs my unit something. This costs my commanding officer. I don't want to get him in trouble and things. There's a, they paid a great price to send me here. You know what? I'm just going to do the, the absolute minimum that I have to do. Two different types of Christians. The one Christian says, hey, Jesus Christ paid it all on the cross. Woo, yeah. I can go and mess around with my life. And Lord chastens you the whole time. That's rather stupid. Or you can be a Christian that says, you know what? I can't imagine how much he suffered and how embarrassing that was and what Jesus did for me on the cross. And weep over that sometimes when you think about it. Think about what he went through. You know, that's the whole purpose. A self-examination there. When you come before the Lord and you say, Lord, you know, and you think about, you know, the, the Last Supper there and things like that, the communion time and stuff like that. It's a time of self-reflection. You're supposed to remember what He did on the cross. Remember that. It's just disgusting. And, you know, here again, we have this thing in this country, here in America. People, don't, they could care less about the sacrifices that our forefathers made so that we can have the freedom that we do in this country. And there's freedom, and I know the whole thing, and the Masonic influence and all that. I understand. I understand. I understand that there's all that wicked whatever. But the whole point is, people suffered so that we could have nice things. Remember that. And Jesus Christ is the most important one here for you as a Christian. Remember what He did on the cross. That should change your attitude about sin. And you should say, you know what? I don't want to live in that sin anymore. I mean, I could, I could take, my computer's on right over here. I could just say, okay, you know what? I'm just going to put this Bible down here and I'm just going to go watch some porn for another hour. Which, thank the Lord, I've been clean of that whole wicked, satanic junk for many, many, many years now. But I, am I going to lose my salvation if I walk over there and watch some pornography? Nope. What stops me from doing it? My Savior. It's self-destructive too, by the way, but mostly I think about Jesus Christ dying on the cross. Pain, agony, crying, the blood that he shed. Why on earth would I want to inflict more of that? It's all paid for, Brother Brian. You can do whatever you want. Okay, then I'm not going to bring more sins upon my Savior. I'm not going to put more sin on him as he's on the cross. He became sin for me. Why would I continue to rack up the debt? doesn't make any sense. Judge yourself. You see? Go back to Hebrews chapter 12. You get these Christians, oh, it doesn't bother me. It doesn't convict me. Are they saved? I don't know. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 9 through 11. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? For they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure, but he for our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. Now no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. Wow, some really good stuff. I mean, again, you know, I'm so thankful the Lord gave me a son because it's really kind of revealed a lot of my relationship to my Heavenly Father and uh, so many of the dumb, stupid things that I do, you know, and, and, and I'm, you know, the Lord's up there just going like, what are you doing? <laughs> you know, I get to experience it now with my own son. He does stuff sometimes and I just go, son, what are you doing? Stop right now. Are you going to stop? You know, he's got to spank you if you don't stop soon. Please stop. You know, it's, it's crazy. Let's go over these verses again. 
Verse 9, Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? Yeah, yeah. Again, I was spanked when I was little. I did wrong and things like that. My father corrected me. He didn't come over and hug me and give me a little piece of candy or something. No, I got spanked. I did wrong, I got spanked. I didn't enjoy it. Okay, I tried not to do it then in the future. Verse 10, For they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure, but he for our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. You know why God chastens you if you're truly saved? Because he wants to make you like him. And it's funny here, it says too in the first part of the verse, For they verily for a few days chasten us after their own pleasure. Doesn't mean that, they, that a father has pleasure spanking his child. No, it's just a father is trying to discern, okay, the judging thing there, and said, did he really try to do that? Or was he that intentional and things like this? And there have been times I've, I've yelled at my son and things and you know, punished him and things, and I was wrong. And I shouldn't have. I've, and he's, you know, Dad, I, you know, and he explains to me, Daddy, I wasn't, I wasn't trying to do that. And I... And, you know, my wife sometimes will say, yeah, he was just trying to, oh, man, I'm sorry. And I'll get down and I'll say, son, I'm sorry. Daddy was wrong. I shouldn't have punished you for that thing there. I didn't realize what you were trying to do. I thought you were, you know, disobeying and whatever else. There's times I don't always punish correctly. But what about God the Father? Is there ever, ever a time when he punishes you when he shouldn't have done it? When he chastens you and he was wrong for doing it? Not even once. Every single time he chastens you is because you deserved it. I deserved it. Mm -hmm. And why is he doing it? Verse 11. Now no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. It's not fun when you go through it. Nevertheless, afterward it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. When you are exercised to understand, why did God just chasten me? I mean, what is exercise? You keep exercising yourself, nothing happens. No, you exercise to get in better and better and better health, don't you? What about spiritual exercise? The Lord starts to chasten you. Well, I'm just going to keep on doing it. No, no, stop. When he chastens you as a Christian and you take that rebuke from him and that chastening from him and you go, I'm sorry, Lord, please help me to, to stop doing that. The process of sanctification. That's what this whole thing is about. And it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. Has there ever been a time in your life when you were chastened harshly by the Lord and you look back now and you say, boy, I sure am glad he stopped me from doing that going down this path or going down that path or whatever. Mm -hmm. I have had my mind made up different times that I needed something and the Lord chasing me. What are you doing, Lord? I don't understand what's going on here. Time goes by, I look back and I say, Lord, if you would let me get whatever that thing was, boy, been bad news. I mean, right now, it's not fun going through the thing of not having a property, okay? But I can already look back at some of the places we've looked at and we're interested in and said, wow, Lord, thank you. Heavenly Father, thank you for not letting us get those different places and for not letting us make those different bad decisions. You say, well, then you're, you're happy with what you're going through. Not a bit. I don't appreciate it a bit. And see, the whole thing is, you know, I look at it and see... When you're in this time of you're going through something and you're being, you feel like you're being chastened of the Lord because it's just like, I don't get what's going on here, Lord. What's what's happening? That's the time that you examine yourself. You don't just throw a little fit and just stomp your feet and hold your breath and, you know, and get angry at the Lord like a little brat. No, you say, okay, Lord, uh, this prayer request that I have or this thing that I'm going through or whatever else, it's not working out. I don't understand what's going on. Is there something I'm doing wrong, Lord? Is there something that I'm doing that's displeasing in your sight? And you examine yourself. Oh, well, there's that thing. I, you know, I should have taken care of that. And the Lord will convict you on certain things. He'll say, yeah, you need to take care of that, don't you? Okay, I'll take care of that. You know? 
He's trying to make your life better. Psalm 118, verse 18. Back to the Old Testament, Psalm 118. Psalm 118, verse 18. It says here, The Lord hath chastened me sore, but he hath not given me over unto death. Uh, David did some really stupid things. You understand the story of David. He did some really bad stuff, and the Lord chastened him sorely. He gave him a bad weapon, okay? Um, I remember different times growing up, I got some pretty bad weapons, okay? I remember the one time I was in real big trouble. I told this story before, and I had this brilliant idea. You know, children are so brilliant with their ideas. I took a book, and I put it down in, my, in the back part of my pants there, you know? I mean, my dad would never be able to figure that one out, you know? <laughs> that did not work. Uh, I got even more spankings because of trying to put the book in there. So, not a good idea. And I look back now and I say, I'm glad he didn't let me get away with that. The Lord oftentimes is chasing me sore. Because I've been ra rather stupid in my life as a Christian. But when you see these people out there and they don't have the sore chastening. And you look at a guy like Jack Hiles and just prospers, prospers, gets away with crime, gets away with all kinds of horrible stuff, covers up things, all kinds of wickedness and stuff like this. Where's the chastening? It's not there. You see somebody, they profess to be a Christian and they're doing all kinds of wicked stuff and saying things wicked, whatever, and you watch them. They're chastening. They're bastards. They don't know God their father. Or God the Father, I should say. It's not, it's not their Father. But again, let's look at the, the tie-in here between Psalm 118 and the Pauline Epistles. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Back to the New Testament. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Beginning in verse 4. Down to verse 10. It says here, But in all things approving ourselves as the ministers of God in much patience, in afflictions, in necessities, in distresses, in stripes, in imprisonments, in tumults, in labors, in watchings, in fastings, by pureness, by knowledge, by long suffering, by kindness, by the Holy Ghost, by love unfeigned, by the word of truth, by the power of God, by the armor of righteousness on the right hand and on the left, by honor and dishonor, by evil report and good report, as deceivers and yet true, as unknown and yet well known, as dying and behold we live, as chastened and not killed. What did we just read back in Psalm? Psalm 118? I want to get the wording of it exactly right. I don't want to try to quote it from memory. It's not one of my better verses I have memorized. Psalm 118, verse 8. Oh, excuse me, verse 18. Psalm 118, verse 18. The Lord hath chastened me sore, but he hath not given me over unto death. Second Corinthians chapter 6. Verse 9, uh, and behold, we live as chastened and not killed. Ties in Scripture with Scripture. Again, you will see the thing of God's chastening upon His children. It goes any dispensation throughout the Bible. Doesn't mean all dispensations are the same. Absolutely not. But you'll see certain things that overlap the whole way through. And chastening in the life of a saved person be they Christian or Old Testament saint or time of Jacob's trouble saint or in the millennial kingdom or whatever else, God is always going to chasten a son that he receives every single time. And when you don't see the chastening, they're not God's children. Very simple. Verse 10, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 10, As sorrowful, yet always rejoicing, as poor, yet making many rich, as having nothing, and yet possessing all things. Very, very true. But let's finish up here. Revelation chapter 3. There are some other you know, passages about chastening and things like that and chastened and whatever. But uh, these are the ones that, you know, for the sake of the, the time of the study and everything else, these are the ones I used for the study. But you can, you know, when it comes to the Bible, you can just do 
just immense studies and see verses that tie in and this ties in with that and ties in with that and everything else. Um, you know, I, I believe firmly that this King James Bible is a picture of eternity. Um, because when you start to do Bible study, you realize this verse ties into that verse and this one ties way back to the Old Testament book of Genesis and that one ties into the Psalms and then Psalms ties into John and then this one goes over, over to Revelation. That one goes, and it's just, it's just, it goes and goes and goes and goes eternally. Scripture's tying into each other. It never ends. The words of eternal life. Hmm. Interesting. Revelation chapter 3, verse 19 and 20. <clears throat> as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. Do you want the Lord to love you? Do you want to have a loving Father? Then be open to His rebuke and chasten in your life. When He rebukes and chastens you in your life, I'll say it that way. Be open to it. You start doing something wrong, and you start to feel that little tug of the Holy Spirit, that still small voice, stop doing it. Or you open up the Bible and you, you're reading through and you go, oh boy, I, ew, that kind of convicts me. Stop. Stop it. If we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. Get in the habit of judging yourself. Right? It's very, very important. And when the Lord says, hey, this thing is wrong, and he gives you a little bit of a rebuke, you know, <clears throat> notice it says there in verse 19, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. The rebuke will come first. That'll be that still small voice. Stop doing that. Again, you know, I learned that as a good parent, you know, you rebuke your child first. You say, hey, 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 stop that. Don't do that. Chastening doesn't have to happen if he stops it. If he continues, well, then there has to be some chastening. Just as simple as that. But what should you do? Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Okay? Look at the context where the word repent shows up. It'll be defined by the context. Okay? In this instance right here, repent doesn't have anything to do with you, you know, the early, when you come to the Lord, you know, it comes to call sinners to repentance. That's not what's going on here. This repent here is talking about you changing your direction. Change your mind, change your direction. That's what it's talking about there. If you're doing something wrong and the Lord gives you that little rebuke, and if you don't listen and He gives you the chastening, you need to be zealous and you need to repent. You need to stop doing that thing. That's what you need to do. So, that's going to be it for this study. Uh, very important subject. I, don't, I really don't think I've ever preached on this thing before. You know, a lot of times I'll be doing studies and I'll get to a verse like this and I'll kind of say what I believe on the whole thing. But this is the first time that I'm aware of that I actually had a study specifically on the thing of chastening in the life of a Christian or anybody that's ever been saved. It's going to be there. And it works two ways, like I said. Number one, it's there in the life of a Christian to make you a stronger Christian. A loving father, you know, is going to rebuke you and chasten you. Uh, he's, he's wanting to make you, you know, holy like he's holy. Uh, he wants to sanctify you. Um, so there's going to be that thing there for you as a Christian that you look at it and you, and you say, okay, I want God's judgment uh, in my life. I want him to tell me, don't touch that. You know, I mean, if there's a live wire over there, and you go to reach for it, you know, say it this way, if I see my son and he goes to reach for a live wire, and I just go, am I a loving father? No, I'm going to yell at him and say, don't touch that, stop, don't, no. You know, the Lord's the same way. Do you want the Lord's love? Well, then be open to him saying, don't touch that, don't do that, don't watch that. You know, that's the first thing. It's positive. The negative aspect of the thing of chastening is not for you yourself, okay, but looking at people and saying this person claims to be saved or they claim that that person there was a Christian or whatever else was their chastening in their life. Again, I've, I've heard of Christians, you know, that that uh, they've messed around and stuff with sin and something bad happens to them and they're, they're done. 
the finished. Christians that, that die and whatever. I mean, I've I've seen the thing. I've seen you know people that are that are Christians and and you know I can't say some of them really try their best to to try and you know look like they're lost, but I've seen some people that are professing Christians. And they start to mess around with the authority of the King James Bible or some other thing like that, and it's just like, bam, their life falls apart. Now, if I was to guess, I'd say there's a carnal Christian because the timing of it is just too supernatural for it to just be coincidence. There are no coincidences if you believe the Bible. But I look at them and I say, hmm, you know, I look at that and I say, that's when they started to get messed up. And within a couple of days or whatever else, many times within hours, I see, boom, something major bad happens in their life. What's going on? God's chastening. That's how the thing works. So let's close with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I do thank you for the standard of your word, um, that we don't have to walk around blind down here, uh, spiritually blind. We can know exactly what you want. And Lord, I pray that you would please help us all to judge righteously um, and to look out there and, and Lord there's so many false deceivers false people coming into this movement the King James Bible believing movement please give us discernment Lord and um, for those that are out there that are just they're saved but they're just really messed up I pray Lord for your chastening in their life uh, your rebuke and your chastening um, you send the Holy Spirit out Lord and, and uh, convict them uh, it's not about me. It's not about my words and uh, whatever. I, I want it to be about you, Lord. And um, I just I do pray for that. And I pray that you would help us all to not get entangled in things that are where it's blind leading the blind. Just to let them alone and realize that we are running a race that's set before us and there's not much time left. The finish line is fast approaching. And I just pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. That's going to be it for this study. And brethren, that last little part of my prayer there is, is really what I'm feeling. Um, you know, I mean, it's just like the rapture thing, you know. You just look at this world and you go, how on earth, how can I keep going on like this? Um, because the Lord is trying to get the last few people there, save them, get them out of this mess. Uh, I'm, I'm astounded that anybody who's lost that watches these videos could remain lost. It's not about you converting to be a Denlingerite or something stupid. Uh, you need to get saved. Look at the world around you. Are things getting better? Uh, things are falling apart. Uh, there's not a whole lot of time left before God's judgment and His wrath comes down on this earth. And for you Christians out there, um, please be open to the Lord's chastening and His rebuke. In your, well, first of all, His rebuke and then His chastening. If He rebukes you, for heaven's sake, stop. Be zealous and repent. Turn from that thing. And you want that fellowship with you and the Lord. I mean, I can tell you right now, I am, I am petrified of putting this book down. I'm petrified of that. Because I know how weak my flesh is. And I know how quickly... I would just go and just right into the ditch. Boom. As a saved man, I know what my flesh is capable of. Um, I understand what could happen to me if I start messing around too much with the flesh. What do I want? I want God's, uh, His rebuke and His chastening in my life. And there's times, you know, it's hard to go through sometimes because the whole thing is, Here's another thing you need to understand, and I'm preaching to myself big time right now, and that is there are times when God is working out a plan and He's got this thing coming over this way and He's got you coming in here and He's looking and saying, okay, I'm going to speed this up a little bit, okay? You know, He's bringing a plan together. And that's hard to, to go through sometimes. Uh, you know, what we're going through in our property situation right now, just to give you a little heads up, the closing date got delayed again supposed to be Friday, didn't happen. They found some kind of a tax thing that wasn't paid or whatever else and some kind of deal on the records way back and stuff like this many years ago. 
and and this thing is they're not going to give the loan because of this and well well we'll do this and there's more and more little paperwork scheming things and having to sign more papers and and I'm just like you're kidding me <laughs> you know what's going on lord's working something out you know a lot of people are like it's the rapture it's going to be the rapture and everything else i hope so but uh i'm just going to keep on trying I'm going to keep on just trying to serve the lord through this time and it's rough I mean, you sit down and start, you know, working on a detailed sermon or going and researching and things like this when you're getting calls from a real estate agent and we're going to be closing here. And I got, oh, I was going to inter be interested in this one property. Again, property. Totally was just like, wow, perfect place. We went to see it, you know, just went and drove there and looked at the area and everything else. It was like, this is perfect. It's exactly what we want. Right price range. Everything's perfect. And setting up a you know contact to the realtor and it was like we want to go set up a time to look at the thing and that kind of got delayed for a few days and whatever else finally it's like okay waiting to hear back from the realtor check the ad again off the market and i'm like you know i don't know if it's sold or they just took the thing off the market and i'm going are you kidding me i mean the thing just came up and like within a week it was off the market and i'm going oh, what is going on here it's just trial after trial after trial right now um i mean my wife and i the whole time that we've been married we've been looking to have a final place where we can say okay let's organize things let's let's get stuff and whatever else and we try to do things as cheaply as we can you know and it's just been just hindrance after hindrance after hindrance after hindrance a lot of it i don't understand but you look back and you say, okay, are you glad for where the Lord's gotten you to right now? Yeah, yeah. Do I understand everything that's ever happened? No. Do I understand everything that's going on right now? No, <laughs> definitely not. But uh, you got to trust Him. You say, do you trust the Lord? Yeah, I do. I do. You know, again, you know, I've had people try to encourage me there and stuff and just say, you know, it's supposed to be happening. I know, I know. <laughs> but it's just... You know, it's grievous right now to be going through. Um, we want this so badly to be able to just say, okay, that's where we're going to be living until the Lord takes us out of here. Fine, you know, okay. Um, so uh, we always appreciate people's prayers. And, you know, I got to say this too, because I've gotten, the, I get such idiots in the comments. I get this thing, some people have been saying, I got a couple of them, I just block them, but it's like, it irritates me. And I, you know, just, just to say this, because, you know, I know people, you see a lot of the attacks on me and you go, I wonder if that's true. You know, stuff starts getting in your head. I know. But uh, people are saying, whenever I ask for prayer, that's me actually asking for money. Like, no, I, I'm actually asking for prayer. All right. Um, right now we have enough money because of selling things and whatever else that we're going to be able to get a decent property. Nothing too great and i'm going to be having to build and things on that property praise lord whatever but uh i'm you know there's so many lies out there about me right now you know by evil report and good report but uh just wanted to update some you know everybody on that um so uh that's going to be it uh again be open to the lord's rebuke and you know, when he chastens you when he punishes you, it's because he's looking out for your best interests. But if you're looking at somebody and you don't see the chastening there and you're wondering, is this person genuinely saved or not? Is there chastening there? Do they have a humble spirit about them where they talk about some of their things where they've messed up and whatever else? Again, I've seen lost people that are professing Christians and there's a spirit of pride there and everything else. And it's just, you know, they'll talk about Jesus. They look like they're very sanctified. They'll quote the King James Bible, all kinds of things like that. But they won't talk much about their struggles. Well, if Paul is our example, look at Paul throughout the Pauline epistles. I mean, he's depressed. He's struggling with his sin. He's all kinds of stuff like that. But some of these people get arrogant, and you won't hear them talking much about their own struggles with sin. I'll tell you right now, I struggle with sin. I've had some real bad struggles. I've had some real failures. Believe you me. You're not looking at a ultra holy man that's just levitates about a, you know, seven inches above the ground or something when I walk, you know, and whatever else. Uh-uh, no. I've messed up. But I know what to do when I do mess up. 
come to the Lord and say, Lord, I'm sorry. Judge myself. So that is going to be it. Uh, thank you to everybody that's watching. And of course, your prayers. We do covet that. And uh, so I guess we'll see you in the next study.